Hello and welcome to Clearing the Lens with me, Melissa Sitole, a podcast to equip and help you in your ultimate calling, which is to glorify God. I'm a newlywed, a mom, a Bible-believing Christian, and a woman in corporate, and I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Happy Wednesday! Today we're having a conversation with Cindy Levabaza. Cindy is an avid writer and researcher. He's an author on the Mail and Guardian, News24, Business Live, Daily Friend, to name a few, and numerous other good South African news and opinion platforms. And he's an aspiring economist. His topics of interest cover a range of relevant topics such as politics, small business, cities and economies, and the development thereof, and a wide range of social issues. We're going to have an interesting conversation on the tug of war, maybe standoff rather, which we all witnessed in the Western Cape between the city of Cape Town and Santaco. I know we all had different opinions on this because of its widespread impact. And so I really want this episode to make us think deeply about the way we think about the state of the country we live in, what it will take to live in a country where we are all treated equally under the law, and what we're willing to take as collateral damage to get there. I end off with an analysis of what the Bible has to say around the responsibility of government and us as Christians, and leave you, the listener, to think about that some more for your own decision-making now and in the future. All right, let's jump in. Afternoon, Madge. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad that we could finally make this happen. Very pleased to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. Um, So I've already introduced the topic uh, to my audience, uh, but really I'm just going to briefly, today's conversation, we're really just going to be talking about the eight days and psycho strike, um, ultimately in response to city of Cape Town's decision to impound minibus taxi vehicles. Um, I really want us to go into the history, how we got here. Um, and ultimately I want us to chat about what we as citizens should expect from those in power to govern us and how we need to balance them with the nuances that we find in our country. So really to start us off, um, for those of us who don't understand where all this started, please just take us through the journey. Is this situation something which began three weeks ago or has there been this tension between Santaco and the city of Cape Town for quite some time? I think this is something that didn't begin um, like when the strike happened, I think one of the things that people need to understand is that we need to take it back a step. So firstly, the the problem with uh, that Santaco has with the city of Cape Town is that the city of Cape Town is um, enacting something called the National Land Transport Act. So basically, they are there to govern taxis to actually behave like we are expected as other road users who are driving on the roads. Um, part of that is that Santaco was asking the city of Cape Town if they can use the same lanes as the buses. So like the Golden Arrows, the subsidized buses um, that uh, the city services use. The other issue, and this is something I picked up from the reading, is that Santaco has issues with not being a subsidized form of transport. And the argument from the city is that they are not formalized um, and therefore they don't pay taxes while other services in the city do. So what the taxi industry wants is to have their cake and eat it too. So also the other contentious issue, as often been said, is the impoundment of vehicles, vehicles that are unsafe. So if you ask commuters, the vehicles are unsafe, they're often overcrowded, and the drivers often drive poorly. And in defense of the drivers, that's because they have to hit targets from taxi bosses. So there's that issue as well. The drivers are just kind of like what's called the shuttlecock between commuters and taxi bosses in that they are forced to behave in a certain way. They're incentivized to behave in a certain way to meet their targets or they don't eat. And they often have, and there's an article in Ground Up, which is very good about how taxi drivers are treated by taxi bosses and how they have to do certain things and behave in certain ways which are sort of anti-law ways and ways which you often see on the roads how taxi drivers behave. So that's the issue. And when often when these taxis get impounded, it's often the driver who sometimes has to foot the bill, not the taxi boss. And that's the unfortunate thing. And I think Santaco knows what they're doing when they do that. Ultimately, for me, and I think we're going to get onto this, I think Santaco is 
not necessarily protecting commuters or protecting taxi drivers, which are the working class people, but protecting some very vested interests, which is the taxi bosses who are very wealthy, by the way, because they don't pay taxes and they're not formalized and they're not subject to sensible regulations in which public transport should be subjected to. Is this tension unique to the city of Cape Town? And if not, how are similar tensions, because I would imagine that it is quite common across our whole country, um, how are similar tensions being handled in other parts of our country? I think this is happening in other parts of the country. The issue is in other parts of the country, the law isn't enforced. So in other parts of the country, people just say, well, you know what? They're carrying commuters, so let's kind of just let it go. It's the South African thing of we're doing things, um, I'm looking for the word, that are just expedient rather than things that are good and are right and establish kind of the law and order thread. Because that was the care the city of Cape Town's defense, was that they have to, has to be seen in the broader context of law and order. It's understandable that a lot of people suffered when the strike happened and Santaco and the taxis withdrew. However, the taxi industry has a history of being a law unto themselves and kind of operating in a parastate manner. You can see it everywhere. It's not just there was they used violence and intimidation in Cape Town when they didn't get their way. You look at what happened in Ekobeja, like two years ago in a township where a taxi driver and a Somali man crashed. And what they did was they got out and he called other taxi drivers. And this is an area with a lot of Somali businesses. And what they simply did was they torched this man's A4 and they beat him up. And the Somali shop owners then retaliated and went and beat up the taxi drivers and burnt taxis. Now, you can see the problem when you don't have an established rule of law. The whole idea behind it politically, at least the theory, is that the only people who should have the right to violence, legitimate violence, we invested in the state. So if you have a dispute, you go towards the state, which is supposed to be agnostic. So this person crashed. There are processes so that you limit damage. Now, because there isn't a set rule of law and taxis are comfortable acting in ways which are contradictory to the rule of law, as they did in Cape Town during the strike, it accelerates all of the terrible damage. So you saw with the food insecurity in Cape Town, you saw with the intimidation, you saw with buses getting torched, you saw with a bus driver being shot dead and people dying. And that is what the Cape Town Mayor Jordan Hill Lewis was trying to get the public to understand is that yes, there is pain happening, but there is bad acting that is happening from Santaco and the taxi bosses. Not commuters, not taxi drivers, but the bosses themselves. Mm -hmm. And also, we, we can't overlook the idea of the violence that surrounds the taxi industry. And so, for example, my mother is a Methodist minister, retired one. And she was telling me the story the other day when I was talking to her. And she was telling me about a Methodist minister, and this is in the Eastern Cape, who was, who was basically carrying passengers to go to a retreat and they got stopped by taxis because taxis in the Eastern Cape, because they're a law unto themselves, they're cracking down on lift clubs because they're losing money. Again, you are taking wow. away other people's rights. And they beat a minister and beat a minister bloody, bloody. And he had to end up in hospital for weeks on end because he was part of a lift club of lifting other ministers to go to a retreat. And this is the issue that we have in this country is because sometimes we look at it as like, okay, and it's understandable in Cape Town because of the narratives that's around Cape Town is that, oh, well, it's the big bad white DA and it's the black industry that is a taxi industry. When there is no establishment for things that safeguard people when things go wrong, the people who ultimately suffer are not the people in the suburbs, which are the middle and the upper classes. It's the people where the rule of law, where those people who act like they're not subject to the rule of law they suffer. It's the commuters who were, even when they had access to, to buses, they were too scared to get on them because they were intimidated. Yes, yeah, so, so that is my issue. That is why I took 
such a hard stance and I called it criminality and lawlessness because that's what it was. It's not that I discount um, the experiences of people on the peripheries of city. And you know this, it's something I care about deeply in order to shape the mobility that will help people on the peripheries of cities to get towards uh, nodes of economic activity. But in order for us to do that, we, we cannot have city governments simply being overruled by intimidation and taxi industries that are a law unto themselves. The first building block for a sane and civilized and workable and developed society is that the rule of law supported by institutions that protect everybody. It is vested in the state and local government is part of the state. Wow, that story around the minister is shocking. Um, and I've heard similar, similar stories around that as well. I'm glad that you touched on the part around how similar tensions do exist, but we let it go simply because Santaco ultimately, you know, carries commuters on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a very big need in our country. And looking back over the, the weeks that were, there were a few sources that really tried to be balanced, or most sources, can I say, that tried to be really balanced in their approach to the situation. I know a weekly newsletter that I receive, I won't mention any name, um, really didn't mm -hmm. to take a hard stance on whether the city of Cape Town's response was good or bad. And that's ultimately understandable because of the impact that it has on the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. commutes of passengers. Yeah. And you were, however, one of the few voices that were very resolute in your opinion on how the way yeah. Taku reacted to the, this decision by the city of Cape Town mm -hmm. was lawless and it was criminal. Um, but what would you say to the person who believes that we can't, looking at the situation in our country, looking at the nuances that yeah. around this topic, if we say that we can't take a hard stance on a situation such as this? So the first thing I would say is this. I understand and recognize your viewpoint because I think that viewpoint comes from a place of care for working class and poor commuters. So that I recognize and I want to say, I'm there with you, but as somebody who's very interested in how cities operate, one of the fundamental problems, and this is something that I can look at the research for in the data set. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and take it a little bit back and kind of bring it back around. So the first thing is this, one of the worst things that happened in South Africa was the stripping of Metro rail, um, because people need to get around cities. So we have a vast sort of canon of research of why public transit is so important to the development of cities. The first one is a Harvard study, which showed in America that for every dollar invested in public transit, there is $4 of economic activity. For every $10 million invested in corridors of public transit, there is $30 million dollars in business sales in businesses around those corridors. Wow. Basically, what this study found was that the biggest um, uh, sort of element in, in the rising standard of living or the opportunities that working class kids and poor kids get is being close to public transit. It's the biggest factor that determines upward mobility for them. And if you think about it, it makes sense because if you have access to, to easy, reliable, fast, cheap uh, transport, you can get to the nodes of economic activity. The economists call this labor market efficiency, where people with skills can be matched to the right jobs. And it's something that people often touch on in this country, where they often say, hey, people can't get to job interviews. And part of this, by the way, and it's a credit to the city of Cape Town, they initiated through their buses a free ride system for people who want to get to jobs. The second thing is this, and I want to say this, and it sounds like I'm defending the city of Cape, but I think there's a lot of good stuff that they are trying to do, but that they are constrained. In. The second thing is they want to devolve trains because the idea is fast, reliable, easy, cheap transport on trains will help people, will give the city a nexus to say, okay, let's develop a system around helping people 
who don't have opportunities be able to access transport towards nodes. So I can tell you, I used to live in Kenilworth Upper, which is an affluent area in Cape Town. I was five minutes from what's called the Southern Line. Sometimes when it was busy, like in the morning and I needed to get to town to go handle something and just hop on the train. The trains were full. They're not exactly great now, but it was 50% cheaper than a taxi. You tell me how somebody who lives in an affluent area gets to access transport that's 50% cheaper than working class people on the periphery. I got to use that because nobody disrupted or burnt the Southern line. They burnt all the taxi, I mean, all the, the train lines that went to areas on the periphery of the city. So that is the first argument I would say to people is that the failure of Metro Rail is part of that. And part of easing our dependence on the taxi industry requires a revitalization of rail. Rail, by the way, is also, and this is something that people often ignore, is environmentally friendlier. It's less cars on the road. It's less traffic congestion. It's also, by the way, and it was found, areas, and this is from the American study, the neighborhoods surrounded that surrounded the corridors of public transport, the home values went up by 42%. There's a value creation from a business point of view, from an opportunity point of view, and from a home point of view in which you can develop around those nodes of transport. The second thing is this. If we establish the rule of law, if we get our trains back online, we combine them with buses, and then the taxi industry has to come to the table because they should be integrated into public transport as a whole to make it more efficient. Because the one problem with taxis is that they're not as efficient. It's one of the reasons why people take Ubers instead of like these taxi cabs that you call, because Uber uses technology to be efficient. Public transit can be efficient because you can line up tax, you can line up taxi routes, you can line up bus routes, and you can line up train routes, and you can make commuters pay a sort of flat fee and give former taxi operators a slice of that. So that's possible only if the rule of law is established and people are not allowed to just get away with wanton violence and all sorts of other terrible things. And this is the crazy thing. This will benefit people on the peripheries of cities because you have access points to cheaper, more efficient and faster public transport. That is the nexus part of the nexus of economic growth in cities. So this principle, by the way, it also holds true. And I'm going to bring in something that seems opaque. This holds true even in rural areas. In India, there was a charity, I'm forgetting the name. What they did was they gave rural girls bicycles. Bicycles as opposed to those rural girls walking to school. The principle of safe, fast, efficient transport. And what happened was child marriages for girls under 15 went down. Wow. Marriages before 18 went down. The rate of girls, girls completing secondary schooling went up. And the simple reason was this. The schools in rural areas were far away from where girls are. Bicycling often, is often faster and safer than walking for girls. So that simple principle of wow. safe, fast, efficient transport translates whether you're giving girls bicycles in India or you are building an integrated public transport system in a city that is undergirded by the rule of law and by people who are good actors. It helps people who don't have opportunity. It helps people who are far from opportunities. But, and this is also the other thing, it creates what's called labor market efficiency, which is matching people's skills to the job they want or the job they can do. And it creates wealth for the entire city. So that is my argument. Also, if you have trains that work, people who live on the periphery can go access some of the nice things. They can easily get to the Seapoint Promenade. Maybe if we expanded public transport towards wine farms, people who live in faraway areas who don't have cars can get to experience a wine farm. Do you understand? So that is my thing. We seem to not, we seem to miss what's called the wood for the trees by simply folding up our hands and going, let's be expedient about the taxi industry. The taxi industry needs city governments who are going to take a hard stance and say, listen, you have to follow the rules like everyone else. 
everybody in this country has to feel like everybody is under the same set of rules, which is what the basis of the rule of law is. You're not allowed to just throw a fit, to do things you want, to beat up people, to intimidate, to, to engage in wanton violence, just because you don't want to follow the rules. Uh, yeah, I think I've, I've said it. Thank you, Raj. Very, very insightful. Um, on the topic of safety and efficiency, I mean, I took taxis for nine years of my life since I was in grade 10, 2006. Um, and I can recall numerous incidents where I didn't feel safe in a taxi, where it was maybe with the structure of the vehicle, where it was literally falling no. apart, um, maybe being harassed. I didn't want to take a particular vehicle because of, of that. Um, terrible driving, mm. disregard for rules of the road, or drunk driving, the taxi industry, and just taking taxis in general, it's a world of its own. And I don't think anyone mm. who um, has never taken taxis and had to take taxis can really understand the unpredictability mm. that it can bring into your life just on a mm. clean day. And the threats it can bring to your life on a bad day. But how did mm. we get here? How did the taxi industry become so volatile, so unpredictable. I think in short, it's like a lot of things that are wrong with South Africa. Its basis started with apartheid. It's as simply as that the taxi industry arose as a solution to a need of black people being pushed out of the centers of economic activity and being pushed to the periphery and needing sort of an efficient way to get to work. So that and that and that was never truly policed well. And so people didn't have cars, they didn't have anything. So taxis became okay, I can buy a taxi, fit 16 people, they can go to work. So that's basically it. That even even what people were saying with the apartheid spatial planning, in which mostly black and colored people in Cape Town at least, is that they are on the periphery. This is all part of unjangling sort of the negative effects of apartheid. It got there and then it got mixed up with a whole lot of, of really just turf wars and unfancy turf wars because as you know, taxis fight for routes and they start acting on turf wars and then violence follows. And so that is part of the problem. And so fixing that at part of a strategy of undoing sort of apartheid spatiality because not everybody can live in the center of town. Somebody has to move out that way. That's just basic math and basic, you know, spatial recognition. Not everybody will live near the centers of work, but what we can do to ameliorate that is to give people efficient, cheap, uh, fast public transport that is not going to be, you're not going to be stuck on the roads and traffic congestion for hours on end before you get home, especially if you have kids, for example, or you're married and you have, you know, your partner. These these things have real social effects in the sense of parents can't get home to their kids, parents can't get home to their partners, marriages and children suffer. And so we have to really, if we are to say, hey, because what happened is, and, and this was really disappointing for me, is that the ANC and the EFF took this, this sort of very ideological stance, this whole ooh, big bad white DA, or oh, they, they are against working class uh, commuters, et cetera, et cetera, because the, the images were very uncomfortable. It did not sit well, and it shouldn't have sat well with people. Do you see people walking home for hours on end? However, we have to look at the structure and design of that in the sense that there are broader problems in the system. Simply saying, okay, we've disrupted an already terrible system. Let's go back to it instead of going, hey, let's think deeper. How do we ameliorate the problems of people living far from economic activity and opportunities? How do we ameliorate the fact that people, it takes too long for people to get home in the evenings because they're stuck in a taxi in traffic. And then the taxi driver then drives dangerously because of that, because he wants, he also wants to get home. Because I think one of the things that we could do if we integrated all our public transport in this country, and it wouldn't be easy, by the way, is that you could get better conditions for taxi drivers. Because it's something that people don't talk about and ground up mentioned in an article, is that taxi drivers have no health benefits, no retirement benefits. They have no 
sort of salary protection. It's just, hey, meet these targets. If you don't, you and your family don't eat. Which is why taxi drivers are always on edge and doing things which are dangerous because it comes from the top and the taxi bosses and Santaco, which protects those taxi bosses. And if we're going to be smart about this, and I say this in particular as black people, because there is a history of us taking taxis and there's a history of, you know, family members taking taxis and understanding the frustration of being far from opportunity. Those of us who have the opportunity to speak on this have to be able to say, hey, we can do so so much better than simply defending the taxi industry. We can say there is a positive solution, or there's positive steps towards solutions that will untangle this mess that we've inherited. So I think for me, the first thing and why I was so strident in talking about Santaco's lawlessness is because that is the basis. That is the absolute basis for us doing all of these things. On the topic of other political parties' reactions, the Daily Maverick had reported that it was in the city of Cape Town's council meeting, I believe, it was disrupted by the EFF and the ANC, where they were crouching down with JP um, and the ANC participated in this in this um, disruption. I think the ANC in the Western Cape also asked national government to urgently intervene in the ongoing tax issue. So what should we make of this? Do these parties just care more for the commuters, for the men on the street, or are they for the people, or is there something more at play here? Um, I think part of it is bad acting. Um, I think obviously in a, in a situation of competitive politics and a party like the ANC, which is feeling kind of the effect of losing a grip of power, and the EFF, obviously, in terms of their own ideology, it's like, hey, the DA is a quote-unquote white capitalist party, et cetera, et cetera. This is very ideologically driven. So in part, because it's ideologically driven, uh, you're going to have those actions where they disrupt and they do certain things where sort of we don't get to speak about the broader issues as we've done today, about what the problem is. Because it's easy to go, hey, let's defend the taxi industry, as they did, against what the DA is doing in the impoundments, because there is a powerful image in front of us of commuters suffering. However, when you kind of pierce back the curtain, you look at what they're saying and you go, these people don't stand for what's law-abiding and what's good and what will eventually, in the longer-term picture, uh, result and better outcomes for commuters, especially commuters who live far from opportunity. And the thing is for me, and I want to say this, is that I'm not sure the city of Cape Town and, and broadly the DA always does a good job of communicating these sorts of things. Um, I think often, and someone like J.P. Smith, they often speak in a language that's more understandable and accessible to upper class people, and in particular, upper class white people where it's like, oh, it's lawlessness, it's this, it's that. And they don't speak enough about the other side, which is the human side of people who are frustrated and don't have opportunity. And I think that's one of the flaws, by the way, of the DA. And full disclosure, I'm just a, an ordinary basic member of the DA so that nobody can accuse me of saying I'm being dishonest. But I think that is a very real weakness, broadly speaking, of the Democratic Alliance and often why they are attacked on that point. And this was especially seen in the taxi strike. It's it's not like what they were doing was necessarily wrong. It's just the way that they went about doing it, and especially someone like J.P. Smith, it, it, it didn't resonate with voters. They didn't understand the context that they were speaking at because um, optics matter. And I think they, they weren't good on the optics. According to Arrive Alive, uh, the taxi industry accounts for over 63% of public transport work trips. With this percentage in mind, which ultimately indicates power in and of itself, yeah. can we really, as South Africans, ever expect to have a law-abiding taxi industry that's subject to the rule of law like the rest of us throughout the country? And what will it take for us to get there? I think we have to circle back to the revitalization of our trains. It's as simple as that. But in order to do that, we also need 
um, law enforcement agencies um, and money funded to protect the infrastructure of trains. Because, for example, in Johannesburg, uh, Metro Rail has been stripped bare. It's been taken for scrap metal and all of those sorts of things. We mustn't think there isn't sabotage. Sabotage is a thing in this country, as we've seen with ESCO. And I think if we are going to support a law-abiding thing, we have to revitalize our trains. That is numero uno. If we're voting in local elections in 2026, we have to expect our politicians to prioritize trains. The city of Cape Town's already done that. They've been asking for the longest time, hey, give us control of trains so we can make them work. And I think that is part of building something that's built on the rule of law. Because if you have operational trains and buses and the infrastructure, eventually, and that is protected by the rule of law and law enforcement, eventually the taxi industry has to come to the table. I mean, look at unions. Unions were talking about the taxi industry must formalize. Because even they understand, if the taxi industry does not formalize, pay taxes, and get into the mainstream, we are going to have these problems with unaccountability and wanton violence and lawlessness. Lastly, uh, Madge, what is the bare minimum that we as citizens should expect from a ruling party going into next year's elections? Um, and I know that this may be a difficult question to answer, but what are your um, on our own tolerance levels for collateral damage in the road to achieving the South Africa that we'd all like to see become a reality? That is a tricky question outside of what the ANC is, because all we've ever experienced in this country, and we have to remember that and take it a little bit back, is that all we've ever experienced is one party rule. We went from the National Party to the ANC. I think if we're going to have an alternative, it will probably be a coalition alternative. That could be this new multi-party charter, or it could be the ANC and EFF coming together and doing that. So some people don't breathe e easy with that. Um, I think for me, uh, if we we want to sort of have an idea of what to do, um, and I, I was writing an article actually today about this, is there are three things that are important. It's infrastructure development, it's a professional public service, and it's economic vitality. So in short, infrastructure development, we need a big infrastructure program that can be manned. Um, I'm not going to go into all the detail, where water, sanitation, energy uh, generation and transmission, and sort of road infrastructure is done. Because one of the reasons we're losing high-skilled people in this country is because of load shedding, water shedding, poor roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The second thing is a professional public service where people are suitable and qualified and experienced to run municipalities because municipalities are charged in the constitution with delivering services to people. And that is the coal face of government. We need people in municipalities who know what their jobs are and who can do their jobs properly. Best person for the job, full stop. Because ultimately we are suffering and people are the ones, the poor, poor people are often the ones who suffer the most. Because wealthier people can get boreholes, they can get uh, uh, solar panels, yeah, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And when, and when they go off, the subsidization to poor households also ends in the system, in the grid system. And the third one, I think, is economic vitality. My personal opinion is that we have to have a sort of economic program that takes into account what this country's labor market is, which is young, unskilled people. Um, we have a billion people north of us who need pots and pans and clothes and all sorts of other stuff. And we have global supply chains, which are in tatters because of the some of the quiet, like sort of cold war between China and America. Uh, so we need to take advantage. We need young people at work. We need young people making stuff. We need our harbors and our ports to work. We need this Africa free trade agreement to work and to push for it so that we trade because Africa has some of the lowest um, uh, uh, metrics for intra, what's called intra-trade, which is what inhibits our growth, our economic and job growth. 
So in closing, I think that's what we need to do. Thank you so much, Cindy. This has been such an insightful conversation. I really look forward to having you on as a guest in the future. Thank you so much, Mo. Appreciate it. Thank you to the audience as well for listening. Wow, what an interesting conversation. And really, from someone that you can tell is so passionate about getting our cities to work. And that's something I think we can all be on board with. As promised at the beginning of the episode, I do want to go into what the Bible has to say about the rule of law and what we should expect from our government. Romans 13 verse 4 says, For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. 1 Peter 2 verse 13 to 14 also says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 to 2 we read, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. We see in these verses that the responsibility of government or those in authority is to bring punishment to the wrongdoer, to punish evil, to praise good, to play a part in us leading a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. What about our responsibility? Romans 13 verse 1 to 2 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. We read in one piece of that it says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors. And so from what the Bible has to say, our responsibility ultimately is to obey, unless of course we're being asked to go against God's word. As seen in 1 Timothy, our responsibility is also to pray for our government, not just about them. <laughs> I've spoken before of Joseph and Daniel who worked in the government for pagan institutions, but stewarded that responsibility and served faithfully. This idea of every authority that exists being appointed by God is a tough pill to swallow, especially when we see so much corruption by those called to serve in our country and continent, when we see evil not being punished, and we have to pay premiums to have some sort of peaceful or safe life because of institutional failures in our country. But we're not the first generation to experience this. In history, the Bible, it's filled with instances of corrupt leadership. The Bible was not written in a utopic state. The world has always had its imperfections, but God still repeated these commands to obey and to pray, because ultimately, as difficult as it may be to accept, his sovereign will has allowed the governments we have seen to be in place, and his will has the power to remove them. When we have a chance to make a decision, let's decide against a standard, the standard being what leaders should do, what we can and should expect, and not decide from a place of resentment or revenge or even fear. But also, let's realize that God uses governments, whether good or bad, and our response to governments as a way to sanctify us because this is an area we must be obedient to the word of God in as well. I hope this episode has in some way given you some tools to do just that. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you tune in next time. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like and follow this podcast or leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. This is me saying goodbye and reminding you of your ultimate calling in this moment, this day and this week to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Hey!